But today I want to talk to you about a message entitled, Which Jesus Are You Following? Which Jesus are you following? I got the privilege a few years ago of taking my father on his first mission trip. We were raised Roman Catholic. Uh, we didn't grow up uh, with a relationship with Jesus Christ. It wasn't until after Hurricane Katrina in 2009 that I got to not only lead my mom, dad, and sister to the Lord, but I got to baptize them as well. You talk about a great privilege that was. And it was the year 2013. I brought my dad on an easy mission trip. It was his first one. We went to Istanbul, Turkey. We went to Cairo, Egypt, and we went to Lille, France to do mission work there. Just an easy group of countries and places to go. That's a joke, actually. And uh, we went there, and on the trip back, I was going to preach in Lille, France, which is about an hour train ride north of Paris. And after preaching, we were going to fellowship with the believers there. It was a wonderful time, as you can imagine, those believers surrounded by many different denominations or many different religions surrounding them. And at the end of the uh, preaching time, there was a great buffet that we had food, local food. It was great. And then they brought out the desserts. And the desserts were amazing. I never had them before. And there were three different types of cactuses. Has anybody ever ate cactus before, a cacti? I had never before, but I decided to indulge, and I ate one of each of the cactuses. It was amazing. We took the train ride back to Paris. We were going to travel around Paris that afternoon. We put our luggage down, and we made our way to the subway station for an hour subway ride through many different transactions or many different trains to Paris, the inner city of Paris. And I was commenting to the person next to me on our trip just how amazing these cactuses were, and then... It hit me. Mike, our director, leaned over to me overhearing a conversation, and he said, Pastor, do you know cactus is a natural laxative? <laughs> to which he followed up and asked, how many did you eat? <laughs> you can imagine, we had a one-time, uh, one-driven uh, mission at that time. We had to get off the subway to a local restroom, which there were none. We were down in the heart of the subway. And so we were trying to make our way quickly between trains, and my father was with me. And we made our way to the last connection. And the way Paris subways work is you have this little ticket, you put it into the reader, and then the turnstile turns. And so I was walking through the turnstile. I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, whatever you do, do not lose me. Stay behind me. Well, I started to walk through the turnstile. I was following the leader, and then I heard a call of my name, which really brought me back to when I was a teenager. It was my dad screaming in the Paris subway, Robbie! And I looked back, and he was stuck. His ticket didn't work. And so I run back over to my dad. I said, Dad, we, we, we have to go, Dad. You know, what is wrong? And so he's putting his ticket in. It doesn't work. And I noticed at that time other people around me are jumping over the turnstile. And so I thought, well, maybe it's not working. And so I'm telling my dad, who's approaching 70, Dad, I think, I, I think we're going to have to do it. And he actually honestly made the first hurdle fine. He looked like an Olympic hurdler. It was that second one. That guy, his leg kind of, you ever seen this before? Leg kind of locked up out on him and he got stuck. Well, I tried to pull him over the turnstile. Luckily, a woman in uniform came over to help us. <laughs> a French policewoman at that. And uh, she pulled us aside, asked for our pa passports and gave him a hundred dollar ticket on the spot that he had to pay before we left. Now, at that moment, we laughed as we got on the subway. And my dad said, you know, I probably should have stayed where I was and not followed you. He had a choice to make. He could have followed my direction or he could have continued trying to put his card in. Now, you and I know that in life, we have a lot of choices to make, right? There's a lot of choices. You're choosing whether you want to come to a particular school or not. You're choosing who you're going to marry. You're going to choose what kind of church God is leading you to. You're going to choose what kind of job you're going to take in the future. We even have simple choices like how we're going to follow the Lord. Are we going to read the Bible every day? Are we going to pray? Are we going to get alone with the Lord? But I think fundamentally there are a few questions that every person on the planet has to answer. And here are the questions. Who is Jesus? And am I following the real Jesus? Or am I following the Jesus of my own imagination? This morning, I want to bring us back to the courtroom, to the platform of Pontius Pilate, when he is interrogating Jesus Christ to determine if he is the king of the Jews. 
If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, turn with me to Matthew 27, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, who are we following? Are we following the crowd, or are we following the Christ? Matthew 27, verse 11, when you're there, you can say a word. We get excited about the word. We say word at Long Hollow because uh, we know it's the word that changes our life. Amen? So we get into the word, and the word gets into us. I'm reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Version of the Bible. People ask me, Pastor, what is the best version to read from? It's the one you read, right? A lot of people are arguing for translations or not reading the translation they're arguing for most of the time. But anyway, I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard. Verse 11, now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus answered, you have said it. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how much they are testifying against you? But he didn't answer him or even one, on even one charge so that the governor was greatly amazed. The word of the Lord. Let's pray as we begin. Father, I pray today in a very real way that you would bring us to this trial in order to determine who we are following. Jesus the Christ or Jesus of our own imagination. And that we would leave this place really understanding what that means, that it would solidify, that we would be resolved to leave knowing who we're following. And God, I pray today that you'd be the teacher, we'd be the student. We pull a seat up to your table, give us listening ears to hear, and that when we leave this place, we would not say we heard a great sermon or listened to a great preacher or even experienced great worship. That when we leave today, we will say that we have been in the presence of a great God. For it's in his name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. I want to divide this section, and we'll go a little longer in a moment, into three different progressions. Here's the first one. I want you to see that Jesus Christ is rejected by Pilate. Jesus is rejected by Pilate. Now, this is not the first time Pilate rejects him. Pilate has already interrogated Jesus and sent him out. Jesus is now coming back to him. Now, one of the things about Pontius Pilate, it's a fascinating study if you've ever done it. He was over the Roman law of Judea. And the Romans loved him. The Jews, on the other hand, hated him. And the reason the Jews hated him is for two reasons. Josephus, the earliest early historian of the first century, tells us that on one occasion when Pontius Pilate was early on in his reign, he decided to march into the town of Judea with the Roman legion of soldiers, all with poles in their hand, and on top of the poles were carved eagles, the symbol of Rome. Now, why is that a problem for the Jewish people? Not, not everybody at once. <laughs> because God said, don't worship idols, right? Don't worship carved images. And so the Jewish people naturally rioted against Pontius Pilate, causing him to take down the birds. On another occasion, which is worse than the first, Pontius Pilate decides to create a water system for the city of Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, he's going to fund it by taking money from the temple treasury which caused an outrage among the Jewish people. And so it's a hotbed of insurrection in the first century, particularly against Pontius Pilate. And now he's presented with a question. He's presented with a dilemma that he cannot win. If he convicts Jesus, then in a sense, he's going against God. But if he frees Jesus, he's going against the people. He really can't win. And you have to understand what Jesus looks like at this point. When he asked the question, are you the king of the Jews, there's a lot of irony in that. You have to understand, Jesus is standing before him. His garments are stained from the blood that is dripping from his chin. He has just been punched in the face by the high priest. Picture it. He has the spit of the Sadducees still embedded within his beard. Jesus looks anything like, anything but like a king. And now he's saying, are you the king of the Jews? And I notice, notice what Jesus does. He doesn't say anything in response. He just takes it. 
Friends, feel the weight of this. In less than six hours, Jesus Christ has been stabbed in the back by Judas. He's been deserted by his disciples. He's been denied by Peter. He's been punched by the high priest. He's been disowned by the Sadducees, and now he's being sold out by Pilate. A lot has happened in the six hours leading up to the rejection by Pilate. But secondly, we see the desertion by the people. So he's not only rejected by Pilate, he's deserted by the people. Look at verse 15. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered together, Pilate said to them, who is it? you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I have suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and elders, however, persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They all answered, crucify him. All the more. Then he said, why, why, what has he done wrong? But they kept shouting, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting and said, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, his blood will be on us and our children. Then he released to them Barabbas, but after having Jesus, watch this, flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. Ancient sources tell us that in the first century, it was common for governors to release a person who was in prison to the people as an act of mercy. He wanted to show that he was having mercy on the people. And of all the people he could release, I want you to see, providentially, he chooses Barabbas. Now, who is Barabbas? In all of the Gospels, we have different pictures of Barabbas. John tells us that Barabbas was a robber. Mark tells us Barabbas was a notorious criminal. He was always in prison. But here's what Matthew says. Or Matthew says he's a notorious prisoner. Mark says he's a rebel and a murderer. And I want you to understand that Barabbas is being accused of the very same crime that Jesus is falsely accused of. Barabbas is accused of causing an insurrection. Barabbas is accused of being a troublemaker, the very same crime, falsely, that Jesus is being accused of. Now understand this, I believe that when Pilate first goes to the crowd and says, do you want Jesus? They actually are not interested in crucifying Jesus. I don't believe at first they want to. And I'll show it to you in two ways. Look at verse 17. The way Pilate asked the question, it's almost as if he knows the crowd wants Jesus free. Verse 17, Pilate said to them, who is it you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called in a sense, your Messiah. It's almost like he's leading them along. But look at verse 18. For he knew that they had handed him over because of what? because of envy, and this word envy is a crucial word. It means to have displeasure toward another person because you do not want them to have something that they are receiving. And it shows us that they are displeased with Jesus, particularly the high priests and the religious leaders, because Jesus Christ is having what they want, power and fame and respect and a following. And so in the middle of this conversation, Pilate's like, who do you want? He gets tapped on the shoulder, picture it. And he turns around and one of his guards say, "Uh, Mr. Governor, there's a message that just came in from your wife. So he turns around, he's talking to his guards. And at that time, I believe it's when the high priest and the Sadducean rulership decide to rouse the crowd up and you're the crowd. Here's what they say. Hey, listen, Pilate's busy. Listen, when he turns around, here's what we're going to say. We're going to say, we want Barabbas is free. We know he's a bad man, but boy, he's better than Jesus. You guys know Jesus is a bad man. You guys know that, right? 
This is yes, this is a, you guys know that, right? Jesus is a bad man, but we want Barabbas free. So you guys got it? When he turns around, we want Barabbas. At that moment, Pilate, who is oblivious to what just happened, <laughs> turns around and says, okay, who do you guys want? Verse 20, Jesus or Barabbas? What does the crowd say? We want Barabbas. So not only is Jesus rejected by Pilate, but at this sense, he's deserted by the people. And don't miss this. This is a misunderstanding of this crowd. I don't think this is the crowd that just praised him as Messiah when he came in in the triumphal entry. I don't think it's the same crowd. And here's why I don't think it's the same crowd. Those people knew he was the Messiah. Those people believed he was the Messiah. I think here, this is a trumped up group that the Sadducees and their families and the high priests had put together in the courtyard in order to condemn Jesus. I think this is a different group here. So we see not only the crowd deserting deserting him, finally, we see Jesus being humiliated by the soldiers. Look what happens in verse 26. Then he released Barabbas to them. But having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into headquarters and gathered the whole company around him. This is mind-blowing. I mean, think about what's happening here. The whole company is another word to say battalion. It could be in upwards of 600 men. There are 600 trained soldiers about to interrogate and humiliate one man. They are going to demoralize him. They are going to destroy him. They are going to disgrace him would be better. Why? Because Jesus is claiming to be a king and he looks anything like a king. John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Church, comments on what's happening here. And here's what he says, pretty insightful. He says, the soldiers thought Jesus was a village idiot a lunatic who is deluded in every way by thinking himself to be a king. And that is why they mocked him. Now, and I want to show you what happens here. Look at verse 28. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet military robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head, placed a reed in his right hand, And they knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they spit on him, took the reed and kept hitting him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Up to this point, Jesus has an outer garment on, probably a tunic. They strip him of the tunic and they flog him. Uh, Normally they would flog them 39 times. You've heard it, 40 lashes minus one. The reason they would do that is it was an act of mercy. It was believed that 40 lashes would kill a man. So they had an act of mercy and gave 39 lashes. And some of the times people would actually die from the flogging. Why? Because some of the whips would have a piece of bone or hook on the end that it would rip into the skin. They were masters. The Roman soldiers were masters of whipping the whip around the body of an individual. It would embed itself in the skin and then they would rip it out. And so they did this to Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, they decided to gather a scarlet robe. Now here's what's interesting. Of all the colors they could have gathered, they gathered scarlet. And if you know the Old Testament well, you know there is a scarlet thread. You've heard this before. W.A. Crystal preached a great sermon. The scarlet thread that is woven all throughout the Old Testament as a picture of sin. Although your sins are red as scarlet, I wash them what? White as snow. What a wonderful picture of he who knew no sin becoming sin for us is a picture so that we might become the righteous of God. So they put on him unknowingly, probably, they probably knew what they were doing for a different reason, this scarlet robe. Now the reason they put a scarlet robe on him or a purple robe is because that was the signal for authority or kingship. Kings wore purple robes, very expensive. But you have to understand the kind of robe this is. Don't miss this. This is a wool, coarse, scratchy robe. And as they place it on the back of Jesus, I want you to understand how that is rubbing against those open lacerations in his back. 
And if that wasn't enough, they pick up a reed from the ground and they mock Jesus by handing him this reed like a scepter. And then they look for some twigs on the ground and they weave together this crown of thorns that they embed within his skull. Someone gave me recently, Dr. Aiken, a, a crown uh, of thorns. I couldn't even set it on my head. It was so painful. Just couldn't even set it on the head. It was so painful. Imagine as they embedded this in Jesus' skull. And as Jesus has the crown pictured and Jesus has the robe and Jesus has the reed, one soldier gets on the knee and he starts to mock him. Hail, king of the Jews. You're supposed to be king. Show us now. And if that wasn't enough, it says they took the reed. And in the language of the New Testament, it says they began to strike him. It's an active present verb. It's repeatedly, they blow, hit him with blows over and over and over again. And the entire time, feel the weight of this. The entire time, guess what Jesus does? Nothing. This is the man who can call down a legion of angels with the blink of an eye to annihilate his enemies, and he is standing there, he is kneeling there, saying nothing. Now, why in the world would Jesus say nothing? Don't miss this. In the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his persecution, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He is beaten to the point of death, and yet Jesus is still preaching to people in the audience. You know Isaiah 53 well, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. Students, you want to know how much God hates sin? Look at the suffering of his son. Look at the suffering of Jesus here. You know, I've asked myself the question this week, how, how do you apply this text? How can, we, how can we live out what we heard here today? I want to give you one walking point, one point to take home with you. Here's the walking point. Write it down. Make sure you're following the correct Jesus. Make sure you're following the correct Jesus. When Pilate asked the crowd, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They turned the conversation to wanting Barabbas. Did you catch that? We want Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. Well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Well, what did this man do? Crucify him. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this. Crucify him. And in a very real way, I want you to see what's happening in this text. It's mind-blowing. They want Jesus dead, and they want a murderer. They want an insurrectionist set free. What Matthew is doing here in this text is something mind-blowing. He is presenting to us, understand the magnitude of this, he is presenting to us in a visible way a substitutionary interchange of one man for another. Did you catch that? In a visual way, we are seeing, seeing in this text a picture of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Robbie, what do you mean? Follow me here. Barabbas is a guilty man. Barabbas did everything wrong. Barabbas is in prison for crimes that he deserves. Barabbas, don't miss this, cannot free himself. He's bound. But Jesus, on the other hand, is an innocent man. Jesus did nothing wrong. Jesus is convicted of crimes that he didn't commit. Jesus is beaten for things that he didn't do. Barabbas is a guilty man, but Jesus as an innocent man is about to take Barabbas' place. And here's another thing I want you to see. I don't think it's any accident that both men are accused of the same crime. <laughs> did you catch that? Barabbas is in prison for causing an insurrection against Rome. 
And now Jesus is going to die by the Roman Empire for being a man causing an insurrection against Rome. In a sense, Jesus, in a very real way, is paying the exact price for a crime that Barabbas committed. Watch this. Who's Barabbas? We are. You want to know who Barabbas is in this text? You are. I am. Now, how do I know that? Did you know his name's not even Barabbas? Did you know that? It, it's a title for him. He has a different name. Barabbas is a title. It's actually a Hebrew word, two Hebrew words broken up to get down. If you'll see what it means, actually two words coming together as one. Bar in Hebrew, for those who know, means son of. Remember Bartimaeus, Mark 10, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, Bartimaeus, he's the son of Timaeus. But the second part of Barabbas' name is Abba. Abba means what? Father. So it's a title. Barabbas is the son of the father. But if you look in the footnote in your Bible, look in Matthew 27, you look at a footnote next to Barabbas' name and you will see, my footnote says, other manuscripts, look at verse 16 and 17, Matthew 27, other manuscripts read that his man, and these are earlier manuscripts, read that his name is what? Jesus. His name is Jesus. So, so in Hebrew, his name is Yeshua Barabbas, Jesus, son of the Father, and Pilate, whether he knows it or not, is presenting to the crowd two choices. Get this. Who do you want to choose today? Jesus, son of the Father, or Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah? It's your choice. And that's why I asked you when we began, who are you going to choose? A Jesus of your own liking to fit your own power and your own platform and your own ministry and elevate yourself to get your own way? Or are we going to follow Jesus the Messiah? Now, I've thought for a while about this, and I want to bring you back to the cell that day. And I want you to imagine what it was like for Barabbas that day when he was brought on the platform. Have you ever thought about this? He's in the cell, and he is preparing for death. Now, I've studied chaplains through the years, and I've heard that some people, as they're preparing for death, particularly those that are about to be hanged, Days leading up to their hanging will begin to rub their neck, almost feeling where the rope is going to go. And I've heard from chaplains that those on death row that are facing the gas chamber, they have watched them in the weeks leading up to their death prepare for that gas chamber by taking long extended breaths, so much so that they almost hold their breath long enough where their eyes will pop out of their sockets. That's how... That's how much they're preparing for their eventual death. I imagine, feel this, I imagine on that day, Barabbas woke up rubbing his wrist. And he was trying to imagine what it was like for those rusty spikes to penetrate his flesh. And I imagine Barabbas started to wonder what it was like to endure the agony of suffocating on a splintered wooden cross as he hung there. And the night before, he probably had nightmares chasing through his head of the clanging of spikes from a hammer to a nail driving through his wrist into the wood. And he is paralyzed in his cell thinking about this. And all of a sudden, can you hear it? In the distance, he hears this crowd in a frenzy. Think about this. Calling out his name. Barabbas, Barabbas. Barabbas. He, he, he starts to wonder, what is going on out in the courtyard? And then all of a sudden, the chanting is cut short by the clanging of keys from the waist of the guard that is walking down the long corridor to his cell. He hears that solitary key inserted into the lock of his cell. 
When the prison cell is opened in the dark, the guard walks in, imagine it, takes off the shackles from his wrist and his legs, and he is being walked out to what he believes is the end of his life. And he thinks in his mind, it is over. I am done. The end is imminent. I am done. This is a death sentence about to be brought down on me. And when he walks out on the platform, he's standing, get this, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, the Son of God. And Pilate says, which Jesus are you going to choose? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Christ? Stupefied. You have to understand. He's stupefied. He hears, we want Barabbas free. And he walks down that day from the platform and wobbles into the crowd before making contact with the eyes of Jesus. And he realizes at that moment that Jesus took his place. I don't know if this is the case, but I imagine it to be that for the rest of his life, Through the corridors of his mind, what he remembered is the beating of a whip on the back of a man who took his place. You have to understand, there were three crosses on Calvary. One was for him, probably. You know what's neat about Barabbas? He's the only man in human history who can say that Jesus took his physical place. But every one of us here today who has been born again by his spirit through repentance and faith can say that Jesus took our spiritual place. Aren't you glad of that? See, we were destined for damnation, but Jesus made a course correction. It was our sin that we were paying the price for, but Jesus absorbed it, right? It was the wrath of God that was meant for us, but Jesus took it on, and it was hell that we were separated for eternity from God, but Jesus rescued us. Aren't you glad of that? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why in the world, Robbie, would you come to a seminary and preach a message about following Jesus? It's probably what you're wondering. I spent a lot of time at seminary. In fact, I went to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary as a one-year believer one year removed from $180 a day heroin and cocaine addiction. I got radically saved, and by God's grace, I still don't know how they let me in, but they let me in the seminary, and I was there one year removed from this addiction. So to say that I'm a product of seminary education is an understatement. I mean, I went in there with a blank slate. I spent eight years of my life on a seminary campus. It was the greatest eight years of my entire life. I, I just want to be honest. I loved every minute of it. When I went to seminary, I had a lot of friends, a lot of friends who edified me, a lot of friends who encouraged me, a lot of friends who challenged me. It was great to be with those friends. But do you know there were some people in some classes that I asked myself the question, did they even know Jesus in, in seminary? Can I, can I speak freely for a second? For just a second? This is yes. Can I speak freely for a second? Is that okay, Dr. Aiken? And I even question, are guys at seminary following the same Jesus I know? Because what I saw is a lot of guys trying to add Jesus to their ministry. I saw a lot of guys who wanted Jesus to elevate their platform. I saw a lot of guys that wanted Jesus to fulfill their selfish gains. And if you would ask those guys, they would say, I didn't start here. And I don't even know how I got here, but for some way and some reason I ended up here where I was using Jesus to get something. Listen to me, write this down, because it can happen to all of us. Do not fall in love with the ministry of Jesus and fall out of love with the Jesus of the ministry. Let me say that again. Do not fall in love with the ministry of Jesus and out of love with the Jesus of the ministry. Listen, it is Jesus only, right? 
It's not Jesus and. It's not Jesus, I'm trying to make a deal with you so you can rubber stamp my plans so I can have gain in this world. It's no Jesus, I'm submitting to you as a sovereign God because you are worthy to be worshiped. Now I wanna share something with you that I heard long ago and I want this to be the final thing I share because I want it to be embedded in your mind. I heard it years ago, it really caught me off guard. It was by a pastor named Paris Reedhead. Here's what he said. He said, you can determine where your heart is by saying to God, Lord Jesus, I'm going to obey you and love you and serve you and do what you want me to do as long as I live, even if I go to hell at the end of the road, simply because you are worthy to be loved and obeyed and served and I'm not trying to make a deal with you. Friends, don't miss this. We love Jesus and serve Jesus for who he is. We don't love Jesus and serve Jesus for what he can do for us. And I think that's why the song captures it well. Holy King, almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow down. Jesus, only what? Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is the name above all name. You stand alone. I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. Father, that's our prayer. Lord, what more can we say than thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You absorb the wrath of God. You walk the gauntlet that we were meant to walk. You died a death that we deserved and lived a life we never could live. And Father, we say, thank you, Jesus. God, help us to be not only a group of people who know the word, but live the word of God. And God, I pray today for those who are here and know about Jesus, but they may not know the Jesus of the Bible. And I pray for those who have fallen in love with the ministry and out of love with the Jesus of the ministry, that you would bring them back to their first love. For your glory and for your namesake, we ask it in the only name we know how. And that is the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen.
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No. Mm-hmm.